and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Someone pointed out to me last week that I have been mispronouncing a lot of my German, and while we're at it, I suppose I have also butchered some of the Dutch names and places as well in the last episode. So, just another blanket apology. I haven't done one of those in a while. I do my best, but I will no doubt continue to mangle other people's beautiful languages. And well, to all of you Dutch and German speakers out there, in particular, I apologize. Uh, on another note, uh, just a brief shout-out to my friend Ben Kitchings at the History Voyager podcast. Uh, I am recommending that show. It is an interview format show, and Ben covers a lot of topics, uh, not only general history and historical and current events, uh, he also does a lot of episodes on sports history. Um, a few weeks back, he did a three-part series on baseball, which was pretty good. Uh, some of you might enjoy that show if that's your thing, particularly sports history. Anyway... On to today's episode. In the last episode, we talked about the Eighty Years' War, or at least the first part of it, where the largely Protestant Netherlands revolted against their Spanish overlords. From 1566 to 1609, the two sides fought more or less continuously. When the dust settled, Spain recognized the independence of the United Provinces of the Netherlands, at least temporarily, when they signed the Twelve Years' Truce. During this time, during this first phase of the Eighty Years' War, the Spanish versus the Dutch, uh, during this time, the Holy Roman Empire has been operating under the principles outlined in the Peace of Augsburg in 1555. Now, we covered that a few episodes ago, but just to summarize, uh, once again, those principles dictate that the ruler of each territory will determine the official religion, uh, at least between Catholicism and Lutheranism. Those are your choices. And now... The Holy Roman Empire consists of hundreds of small states and statelets. Depends how you count them. There's a minimum of around 350, and if you count all the individual little abbeys and monasteries and even knights with their own independent holdings and privileges, you can get up to as many as 1,800 individual political entities within the Holy Roman Empire. It is a complicated system. The politics of the HRE, as we call it, are complicated. With that many actors involved, they're going to be. And I don't want to get too far off into the weeds, but suffice it to say that the emperor has very limited power. When we hear the word emperor, we think of someone with lots of power as a, someone who has almost autocratic authority, right? Like a Julius Caesar or a Genghis Khan or somebody like that. But the Holy Roman Emperors are jumped-up feudal overlords, basically. They're not emperors in the traditional sense. Right? The Holy Roman Emperor is the largest landholder in the empire, and wields a lot of military and financial power, but decisions, at least the most important ones, are made by the imperial diet. That is an assembly of all the local leaders from throughout the empire. And when the diet meets, the emperor is kind of like the speaker of the house in the U.S., right? The first among equals, Right. The emperor oversees the proceedings and calls people to order and sometimes serves as a uh, arbiter of last resort in the case of a disagreement between members. But when there's anything significant to be done, the body takes a vote. Local tradition and law 
will still trump imperial edicts in most cases. So, during all this time, while Spain is tearing itself apart trying to enforce religious conformity, the Holy Roman Empire is experiencing relative peace and prosperity. Now, I say relative. Yes, I'm aware there are some wars going on at this time. There is... uh, some rivalry with the heated French. The French and the Austrians never did get along very well. And of course, uh, there is also tension with the Ottomans, who are now bordering the southeastern part of the HRE. But for the most part, at least inside the empire, in Central Europe, it's a very peaceful place to be throughout the first part of the Eighty Years' War, right? the second half of the 1500s, roughly. The religious turmoil and civil war that engulfs France and the Spanish Netherlands just doesn't break out there. Right? The Reformation is a fairly peaceful process. To be fair, there are a handful of instances of religious violence. There are a couple of local rebellions and uh, a major uh, succession dispute in one of the territories involving religion. But thanks to the fact that matters of religion in the HRE are local, the outbreaks of violence are also local. When the residents of one city get upset, the residents... A few miles over in another city might not even care because they're not affected by whatever regulation is being disputed. This localization of politics enables the empire to stay at peace and allows the emperor, even though he is a Catholic, to maintain neutrality in matters of religion. But... For anybody who's paying attention in the early 1600s, there are three major threats to the religious peace. The first threat is the Calvinists. While Catholics and Lutherans in the empire have a degree of religious freedom, the more radical Protestants, the Calvinists, they are still officially banned from practicing their religion. This was not a major concern a couple of generations prior in 1555 when the Peace of Augsburg was signed. But two generations later, Calvinism, which was an obscure sect back then, well, now it's becoming a popular religion in parts of the empire. In the Peace of Augsburg, the religious peace does not account for the existence of those people. The second threat to peace in the empire is that major powers outside the empire also have important interests inside the empire. For example, someone who will become very important in this story, won't really talk about him much today, but he's in the background this whole time, uh, King Christian IV of Denmark-Norway the most powerful nation on the Baltic Sea. Yes, Denmark and Norway were a uh, unified, uh, they were still separate kingdoms, but it's what's called a real union. It's complicated. There was a country called Denmark-Norway for a while, and the king, Christian IV, uh, is also the Duke of Holstein. That is a minor imperial statelet inside the empire. So in his role as king of Denmark, Norway, Christian IV is a very powerful man. He's the leader of the most powerful nation on the Baltic Sea. He is, in every way, an equal to the Holy Roman Emperor. But in his role as the Duke of Holstein, he has a certain amount of subservience to the emperor, and he has... He's essentially treated like any other member of the imperial diet. And this will come to cause trouble later on. Along the same lines, the Spanish Netherlands, that's roughly modern-day Belgium, uh, those are hard areas for the Spanish to resupply by sea. They have to go through the English Channel, and the waters in that area are controlled by the Dutch and the English. Right? When the Twelve Years' Truce is up, 
when Spain and the Netherlands presumably go back to war, they want a better way to move troops and supplies. So what Spain has done, indeed what they've been doing all along during their war with the Dutch, is they've maintained a network of alliances in the western part of the empire. This way they can move their troops and supplies over land. And this network of friendly statelets that will allow the Spanish troops to pass through, this is called the Spanish Road. Now, it's not in use during the Twelve Years' Truce, but King Philip III of Spain knows it's just a matter of time before the truce is over, and he is looking to reestablish this rite of passage through the empire. The third threat, we've talked about two threats, we've talked about the Calvinists, we've talked about outside powers having interest in the empire, but the third threat comes from inside the empire itself, and it is in the form of uncertain leadership. Holy Roman Emperor Matthias has been a keeper of the peace, and he has respected all of his subjects' religious freedom, but he's childless and he's in poor health, and he listens to the advice of his brother, Archduke Maximilian, who is a religious hardliner. And in 1617, at the age of 60, Matthias agrees to adopt his young cousin Ferdinand and accept him as his heir. Ferdinand, like Maximilian, is a religious hardliner. He spent much of his life ruling the empire's far eastern provinces and fighting against the Ottoman Turks. In his lands, Catholicism has been the only faith, and being a non-believer has all too often meant that you were working with the enemy. He's not prepared for the more tolerant ways of his German subjects, nor is he willing to learn. But Old Emperor Matthias is not able to just automatically make Ferdinand his heir. For one thing, the imperial lands are not all the same. The title of Archduke of Austria is hereditary, but the crowns of Bohemia and Hungary are elective. The nobles and influential merchants need to be called together, and Ferdinand needs to win their approval. And the same goes for the title of emperor at large. Matthias can't just give the title away. He can give away his Austrian title of archduke if he wants, but the seven electors, these seven major powers in the empire, have to vote on who is going to be the next emperor. Now, the electors are as follows, and oddly enough, the Archduke of Austria doesn't even get a vote, even though for a long time now he has been the king. Now, the seven electors are the Kingdom of Bohemia, the electorates of Palatine, Saxony, and Brandenburg, and the archbishoprics of Mainz, Trier, and Cologne. Now, the Palatinate, Saxony, and Brandenburg, these are all princedoms inside the empire, and they are ruled by Protestant princes who will presumably vote for a Protestant emperor. Mainz, Trier, and Cologne are bishoprics, right? They all have Catholic archbishops, and they are going to be supporters of a Catholic candidate, specifically whoever the Habsburg family likes. That is the imperial family, and Ferdinand is a Habsburg, so he can pretty reliably count on those three votes. So we have a 3-3 split so far. So if Matthias wants Ferdinand to become the emperor, he must first secure Ferdinand's election as king of Bohemia. Then when Matthias dies, Ferdinand will be the seventh elector. He can break that 3-3 tie, vote for himself, and become the next emperor. On June 6, 1617, the Bohemian Diet agrees to accept Ferdinand as their new king with only a handful of dissenters. 
despite the fact that Ferdinand is a Catholic hardliner, most of the Protestant members of the Diet nonetheless agree to vote for him as their king. And they do this for a reason. They do this because Ferdinand specifically agrees to respect the 1609 Letter of Majesty. This is a decree from former Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II reaffirming the right to religious freedom in Bohemia, in particular for the Utachrists, who are the accepted Protestant religion in the kingdom. The Letter of Majesty is long-winded and boring, but I'll read you the most important paragraph. It says, quote, As it is already laid down in the Bohemian Constitution in respect of the faiths of one or both kinds, that no man shall vex another, but rather that all shall hold together as good friends, and the one party shall not vilify the other, so now, too, this article of the Constitution shall be constantly observed, and both parties shall be held in future to respect it, under pain of the penalties provided by law. And seeing that the Catholics in this kingdom are entitled to practice their religion freely and unimpeded, and the Utachrist party, belonging to the above-mentioned confession, may do to the former no prejudice nor impose rules on them, so, in order that full equality may prevail... We permit, empower, and authorize that the above-mentioned United Utraquist Estates, together with their subjects and all persons of any quality without exception who have professed and do profess the Bohemian Confession submitted to the Emperor Maximilian of Glorious Memory, our beloved father, at the Diet of 1575 and now again submitted to us, they may practice their Christian religion in both kinds, according to the above-mentioned profession of faith and the agreements and compositions concluded between them, freely and at their pleasure, in any place, and they shall be left undisturbed in their faith and religion, and also in their clergy and liturgy as they now have it or may introduce it, all this pending the achievement of a complete general settlement of the religious question in the Holy Roman Empire. Unquote. So, on this basis, the Protestant and Catholic leaders of Bohemia stand united behind their new king. On May 16, 1618, almost a year later, Emperor Matthias abdicates his title as king of Hungary, and the Hungarian nobles accept Ferdinand as their king. Meanwhile, the Protestant electors of Saxony and Brandenburg have also agreed to support Ferdinand as their new emperor. It now seems that he will easily win the election when Matthias dies, with only Frederick, the Protestant elector Palatine, as the only holdout. But almost immediately after gaining the Hungarians' acceptance in their kingdom, disaster strikes. See, the letter of majesty is controversial because it doesn't specifically address royal land, right? land owned directly by the king. So, when some Protestants try to build a church on royal land, Ferdinand has them arrested. The Bohemian estates, their local assembly, protest this, so Ferdinand has the estates dissolved. This comes to a head on May 23, 1618. See, Ferdinand is not actually in Bohemia. He has a council of regents there. These are men who rule in his stead. And that day, uh, four of Ferdinand's regents are meeting in the chancellery in Prague, in the very chamber where they deposed assembly used to meet. Shortly after nine in the morning, Count Gendrick Matthias Thurn, one of the leading Protestant lords, leads a crowd of angry Protestants into the assembly chamber. They demand to know whether the regents intend to abide by the letter of majesty. There are four regents there, plus a secretary, and two of the regents say yes, they intend to abide by the letter of majesty, and so the Angry people let them go. But the other two regents will only say that they have to confer with their superior. 
So Matthias Thurn has them arrested, along with their secretary, and he turns to the crowd and supposedly says, quote, See, all dear lords, these men are great enemies of us and our religion. Know for certain, all you lords, that so long as they remain in the country, our letter of majesty will never be safe, nor will indeed the lives of any of us and of our dear wives and children. And were we to keep these men alive, then we would lose the letter of majesty and our religion, and all of us would then be stripped and deprived of our lives, honor, and property." for there can be no justice to be gained from them or by them. Unquote. Now in Prague, there is a strange local tradition of throwing people out windows. There's an English word for throwing someone out a window. It's called defenestration. And that's what's about to happen. And it's not the first time this has happened in Prague, kicking off a war. Depending on how you count it, this is either the second or the third defenestration of Prague, and it is only one of many, many more less consequential defenestrations. Anyway, the following is taken from the account of one of Ferdinand's regents, one of the men who is now going to be thrown out the window of the Chancellery building a man named Count Yaroslav Baritza of Martinice. So take it with a grain of salt, but while the story he tells is self-serving, it's also quite vivid. And when he mentions a fall of 30 cubits, by the way, that's about 60 feet, this is what Count Yaroslav Baritza of Martinis has to say happens when the Protestant lords place the imperial regents under arrests. He writes here in the third person, quote, They strongly pulled them here and there through the entire Bohemian chancellery, starting from the fireplace and ending at the window at the opposite side, crying, Now we will show justice to those who are enemies of our religion. At this, Count von Martinitz said loudly, since this concerns the will of God and the Catholic religion and the will of the emperor, we shall suffer everything gladly and patiently. They both seriously thought that they would be led to the door and then held in arrest for some time. But once they had passed by the door and had seen the window opened immediately before them, they both ceaselessly began to ask for the benefit of a confessor, to whom they wished to confess at once and to ask most fervently for the final righteousness of God. At this, however, the Protestant members of the estates, without considering this ardent request, answered, Yes, we will soon usher in the mischievous Jesuits as well. They're being sarcastic there. And with this, the aforementioned people grasped on to Count von Martinitz, who faithfully commended himself to God the Almighty with these words. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Mother of God, remember me and who wore only a black canvas coat along with rapier and dagger, but not a hat, for this, which had a beautiful braid decorated with gold and precious stones, had been ripped from his hand. Then, bareheaded, he was miserably shoved and thrown head first out of the window and into the castle moat, which was perhaps thirty cubits down and rocky. As he, however, strongly and continuously cried out in turn the holy names of Jesus and Mary, this terrifying toss and fall not only did not deprive him of life, it also saw him only slightly injured, due to the mysterious grace and compassion of God, achieved through the intercession of our dear and most distinguished lady. It was then commonly said, and staunchly avowed as certain by many pious God-fearing people, who claimed to have clearly seen this for themselves, that in the air above Count von Martinitz, who was the very first to fall, appeared the most holy and praiseworthy Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, as his sublime patron, and, so to speak, slowed him in his fall with her outstretched coat placed beneath him, such that he might fall to the earth much more softly. Thus she mercifully helped to maintain him in life and health and keep him from certain death. Although Count von Martinitz had not seen this so clearly, nonetheless it had happened. 
He could clearly remember that while he called out both holy names during his fall, because he had, without despairing, held out strong hopes of finally and at any moment gaining his longed hope for martyr's crown, it truly appeared to him as though the highest heaven opened itself up to him, and that he should soon enter there into eternal glory. Next came Lord Slavata, who also devoutly called out to God the Lord, saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. They first badly smashed the fingers of his right hand, with which he had tried to hold on until they were bloody, and then threw him through the same window, without his hat, and in a black velvet coat with a rapier, and who quickly fell to the earth. He rolled eight cubits farther and deeper into the moat than had Count von Martinitz, and badly entangled his head in his heavy coat. Finally came the third, Lord M. Philippus Fabricius, imperial counselor and secretary to the kingdom of Bohemia. He was chosen mostly because of the demands of Lord Albrecht Hansen Smerzyki, by whom he had also previously plagued in his writings in all kinds of ways. He was also brought by them, in his coat and without a hat, to this window, where he was also assiduously called out to God, God have mercy on my soul, and was thrown into the moat. Unquote. Aside from his obsession with hats, Count von Martinitz's account tells us that all three men survived, although Protestant sources would say that it was not the Virgin Mary that broke their fall, but a fortuitously placed dung heap at the base of the chancellery wall. But while this defenestration of Prague would not be immediately lethal to anybody, it would trigger one of Europe's deadliest conflicts, the Thirty Years' War. Now, the Thirty Years' War is one of the most complicated wars in history, with different countries joining and leaving the war as it goes on. Most of the fighting will occur in Germany, Europe's central battleground where the various powers meet up, but the earliest fighting is in Bohemia and northern Austria, where Matthias Thurn and other Protestant leaders raise an army of Utraquists, Lutherans, and Calvinists to depose Ferdinand as king of Bohemia. Their efforts are hampered by lack of funding. On August 30th, 1618, the Bohemian estates agree to raise a war tax, but they can't agree who will pay or what kind of tax it's going to be, so they all just sort of agree that there's going to be some kind of war tax, and then everybody goes home to their own estates without actually deciding how they're going to fund their army. Well, this will not only weaken their efforts, it will make them dependent on outside aid. Already... Even while Matthias Thurn and the other leaders are trying to organize some kind of response, Emperor Ferdinand's troops have crossed the Bohemian frontier from Austria. They are marching towards the towns of Budweiss and Pilsen, two Catholic strongholds in Bohemia that have remained loyal to him as king. Thurn's army marches out to oppose them. The Bohemian rebels soon get a little bit of help. Uh, they are aided by Charles Emmanuel, the Duke of Savoy. Right. Savoy is a territory in what is now uh, southeast France, northwestern Italy, uh, and they have just finished a war with Spain. And while the Duke of Savoy is Catholic, he fears the power of the Habsburg family. They run too much of Europe for his liking, and he has a bunch of troops who are freshly trained, so he commits 2,000 veteran troops to the Bohemian rebels. This force is commanded by a man named Ernst von Mansfeld, who is another anti-Habsburg Catholic and a skilled field commander. But before von Mansfeld and the Imperial forces can really tangle Old Emperor Matthias dies. So even as Ferdinand's rule of Bohemia is in dispute, 
there is going to be an election coming up. By June, von Mansfeld has taken the town of Pilsen, and the Imperial Army is in retreat. The Protestants continue to advance. Soon, Thurn's army is at the gates of Vienna itself, but on June 10th, disaster strikes the Bohemian rebels. Von Mansfeld's army is defeated in the field in Bohemia. And what this does is it cuts off Thurn's supply lines. He is no longer able to maintain any kind of siege at Vienna, and he's forced to withdraw back home. But still, the rebellion has now engulfed a portion of the empire. And to get to his election, Ferdinand has to travel around the war zone and go out of his way to get there. When the electors meet, Frederick, the elector palatine, right, the one Protestant elector who has not agreed to vote for Ferdinand, uh, he proposes a compromise candidate for emperor, Maximilian I of Bavaria. Uh, Maximilian is a Catholic prince, but one without enough power to rule, without support from Protestant allies. He can't just impose whatever powers he wants. So Frederick Elector Palatine is putting this guy forth and saying, hey, look, he's a Catholic, he's just not a hardliner, maybe we can agree on this guy. But Maximilian refuses to accept the nomination. So on August 28, 1619, Ferdinand II is unanimously elected as Holy Roman Emperor. Yes, even Frederick the Elector Palatine comes along to vote for him, rather than be known as the only guy who didn't vote for the emperor. And this election is... Despite complaints from a rebel Bohemian delegation who claim that Ferdinand himself has no right to cast the vote for Bohemia since he has been deposed. Their complaints are rebuffed. It wouldn't have mattered anyway. It would have been you know, six to nothing in his favor, or assuming the Bohemian rebels got to vote and Frederick sided with them, it would have been five to two. No matter how you cut it, Ferdinand wins this election. And this puts the rebels in a bind. Let's see, they're rebelling against King Ferdinand of Bohemia, not Emperor Ferdinand of the Holy Roman Empire. And as king of Bohemia, or to replace Ferdinand as king of Bohemia, they have already asked Frederick Elector Palatine to be their new king, and he has accepted. He is counting on the support of the Protestant Union, which is a loose alliance of Protestant imperial powers who have sworn to mutually protect each other. Frederick is the leader of the Protestant Union which is opposed, by the way, by the Catholic League, which is a similar alliance of Catholic states led by Maximilian of Bavaria, who was the compromise candidate who wouldn't be elected. Well, now all of a sudden, Frederick, in accepting this title of King of Bohemia, previously he would have just been at war with a fellow prince of the Holy Roman Empire. It would have been Palatine versus Bohemia. But... Now, with Ferdinand being officially the emperor, Frederick is, in a sense, in rebellion against his emperor, even though he voted for him as emperor. It's a confusing situation. It's a complicated one. But essentially what Frederick is asking when he looks for help from the Protestant Union, this group of Protestant princedoms, what he's asking them to do is to support the deposing of a duly elected king within the empire, and also he's asking them to throw the entire imperial election into doubt. He receives little support. He doesn't even get help from the powerful elector of Saxony. As a matter of fact, he can't even get help from his own father-in-law, King James of England and Scotland. Remember, 
These dukes and kings and princes and counts and margraves, they might have religious differences, but almost all of them are political conservatives in the classical sense. They don't want to upend the old order. And as monarchs in their own right, of one scale or another, they certainly don't want people getting the idea that they can throw out their old king any time they like. Not only that, there's a little bit of a problem with Frederick himself. See, if he ends up being both Elector Palatine and King of Bohemia, well, the same person will control two of the seven electoral votes. That is another threat to the stability of the system. So, while Frederick's fellow Protestant rulers aren't big fans of Ferdinand, they're not willing to back this revolt. For them, it's not just about one king or one emperor, it's about preserving an established political order with rules and norms. Even so, Frederick isn't in all that bad of a position. The people of Bohemia, and in fact even the people of uh, largely Protestant northern Austria, well, they're behind him. The other Protestant princes might not be helping him, but they're also not helping Ferdinand either. And if Emperor Ferdinand is going to put down this rebellion, he's going to need help of his own. And this help is soon forthcoming from Spain. As you'll recall, the Spanish Empire at this point is ruled by another branch of the same Habsburg family, and the two branches often intermarry and try to help each other out. The Spanish send an army to assist the emperor, and they bribe the Protestant Duke of Saxony to invade Bohemia. The presence of Spanish troops in the empire, meanwhile, this paralyzes the other members of the Protestant Union. So even had they wanted to go help Frederick out in Bohemia, they can't really do that because there's a large Spanish army in the empire, and if they go help Frederick, then they'll be leaving their own lands undefended, and, well, who knows what might happen then. So they are frozen. Meanwhile, the Saxon invasion into Bohemia forces Matthias Thurn and his army to remain there. Right? They are not able to help out the Protestants in northern Austria, and without help from Bohemia, imperial forces and forces from the Catholic League are able to stomp out that rebellion pretty quickly and contain this forest fire to Bohemia for the time being. Inside Bohemia, King Frederick and Matthias Thurn take a defensive posture. They are able to raise some more troops, thanks in large part to Dutch military and financial aid. The Dutch, remember, are still technically at peace with Spain in the winter of 1619-1620, but the peace is growing more and more tenuous. And the Bohemian Rebellion represents an opportunity to engage in a proxy war. Think of the U.S. and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. They don't want to go to war with each other. That might go nuclear, and nobody wants that. But what about this uh, little country in South America? Well, you know, the... Soviets will fund some rebels in this U.S.-friendly country, and the U.S. will fund some rebels in the Soviet-friendly country, right? It's a proxy war. And with the Spanish now openly taking the side of Emperor Ferdinand, the Dutch are going to use their money to make trouble for the emperor. So now, already... This local Bohemian rebellion has brought in not just the Elector Palatine, not just the entire Catholic League, right? Most of the Catholic states in the Holy Roman Empire, right? Also Savoy, 
and also the Spanish and the Dutch. Very quickly, this war is no longer an internal imperial affair. Already a year and a half in, this is an international war. In the winter of 1619-1620, Austria does suffer a setback. Ferdinand has to look to his own homelands because Austria gets invaded again, this time by a man named Bethlen Gabor. He is the Protestant prince of Transylvania, far to the east, but at this time he also controls much of Hungary, which is supposed to be Ferdinand's kingdom. And he is in an uneasy truce with the Ottoman Turks, who also control much of Hungary. But this invasion of Austria backfires. Right? Bethlen Gabor is unable to conquer the city of Vienna, and he's forced to retreat back east. But it plays against him in Catholic propaganda and, and even more generally in Christian propaganda because Bethlen Gabor has a truce with the Muslim Ottomans and it seems like he and the Ottomans are trying to tag-team the emperor. This seeming complicity with a Muslim power provides propaganda for Ferdinand and the imperial cause. If the Bohemians are colluding with Bethlen Gabor, who is colluding with the Muslim Turks, well, does that make them enemies of Christianity? You can make a few pretty spicy pamphlets out of that accusation. And following Bethlen Gabor's failed invasion in the summer of 1620, things begin to change. For one thing, the Spanish go on the offensive. They attack and seize the portion of the Palatinate, right, Frederick's original land where he's elector, they seize that land on the west bank of the Rhine, right? that portion of the Palatinate that is in modern-day France. Right? Now, officially, the Spanish are acting on behalf of Emperor Ferdinand to restore order, but unofficially, what they're doing is seizing a key territory that is part of the Spanish road, right? their land route to the Netherlands that we talked about. And a lot of what is going on here is the Spanish and Dutch preparing to renew war. But, see, this move by the Spanish backfires. Charles Emmanuel, the Duke of Saxony, and now the new leader of the Protestant Union, he has so far been willing to sit by and even placate the Spanish and the Emperor. What has happened here is a little bit different. This is an outside power that has come in and seized the land of an imperial prince, and not just any imperial prince, but an elector. So the leaders of the Protestant Union gather at Worms, and while well, they don't do anything quite yet, they begin to talk about next steps, and the Catholic forces have to worry about what might happen if the Protestant Union decides they're no longer going to stay loyal to the emperor? On September 28th, 1620, Frederick himself visits his troops in the field. Right there in this sort of defensive posture, and he goes out to do a morale-boosting tour, and it's sort of successful for the moment, but the army, as he learns, is badly organized, right? and lack of pay remains an issue. But many of these men are conscripts. They've been drafted, and without pay, they are deserting almost as quickly as new troops can be raised. At this point, uh, Matthias Thurn had wanted to have almost twice as many troops in the field as he actually has, but all is not lost. Bohemia is a strongly defended land, and Bethlen Gabor, the Transylvanian prince, is once again on the march 
this time not trying to besiege Vienna, but he's launching little raids into Austria and pillaging the farmland and things like that to let Ferdinand know he can't just leave his heartland undefended while he's off fighting in Bohemia. Meanwhile, imperial forces under Johann Seracles, who is the Belgian Count of Tilly, we'll just call Tilly, that's what most historians do, these forces are advancing steadily towards Prague. They're winning victory after victory over small groups of Bohemian troops who are trying to stop them. It's not easy. Disease is sweeping through the army, and Tilly himself is sick, probably with typhus, but his orders are to press on towards Prague. And even as Tilly is invading, the Protestant forces are divided. Matthias Thurn is leading the main army in an active defense, but he's essentially in a fighting retreat back towards Prague. Von Mansfeld, the famous general from Savoy, he's back in Pilsen with a smaller force, but Tilly dispatches part of his own army to keep Mansfeld trapped there. He doesn't want the rebel armies uniting in the field. And the speed of Tilly's advance is surprising even to most of his own troops. See, the Bohemians have left several fortified towns and castles in his path to slow him down. And traditional military strategy of the time dictates that you don't leave enemy-occupied positions in your rear. In fact, that's been the case from the earliest historical wars all the way up to the early 20th century. If you leave a castle or a fortress or an occupied city in your rear, there are garrison troops in that fortified position, and as soon as your army has passed, those garrison troops can be turned into an offensive weapon. But they can launch local raids against your supply lines, and they can make it impossible to supply your main army. So normally, you have to defeat these kinds of strong positions as you go along. It can be very time-consuming, and it can lose you a war. But Tilly correctly calculates that the Bohemian defenders don't have the spirit to launch any raids. So he bypasses their defenses, ignores their garrisons, and continues pressing towards Prague, driving Thurn's army ahead of him. On October 30th, the armies arrive at the town of Rakonik, about 30 miles from Prague. There, Thurn tries to make a stand, and he orders his army to dig in on a high ridge. The first day of the battle the armies engage in hesitant skirmishing. They're kind of shooting at each other from extreme long range, nobody really wanting to take a lot of risks. But near the end of the day, the Catholics succeed in taking a walled cemetery, but they're unable to follow up. On day two, the Catholic cavalry harasses the Protestants, probes for weak points, but... The Bohemian rebels hold them off with gunfire and with menacing displays of their pikes, but again, they don't actually engage in any heavy combat. On the third day, both sides engage in an artillery duel, but with no clear objective or target and with both sides hunkered down, the armies might as well be setting off fireworks for all the damage they're doing to the other side. On day four of the battle, Tilly simply maneuvers his army around Thurn's left flank. This puts him in a disadvantageous position, and he's forced to abandon his dug-in position on that ridge. And then, rather than engage his enemy on unfavorable terrain, uh, Thurn withdraws back again further towards Prague. There's a race there between both armies, but the Protestant army wins the race. 
And on November 7th, they arrive on a wide hill called White Mountain, about five miles outside of Prague. Here, Matthias Thurn decides to make his final stand. He's retreated as far as he can. Now he has to fight. And if he fails, nothing will stand between the Catholic Imperial Army and the Bohemian capital. That night, it's obvious to anybody who's watching that the Protestant morale is already crumbling. They haven't even engaged in any serious combat, but they're poorly trained, poorly equipped, and most of them are conscripts. And at this point, Thurn can't even get his men to dig trenches for their own defense. Everybody has an excuse. People are complaining that they're tired from marching or that the soil is too hard. And by contrast, by the way, this Catholic Imperial Army is mostly made up of very well-equipped professional troops. Still, all is not lost. See, the right side of the Protestant line is anchored by a royal residence known as the Star Palace. It has a strong defensive position. It's surrounded by woods and enclosed by a wall at the high end of the hill. And it's held by elite Dutch pikemen from the Saxe-Weimar Infantry Regiment. By holding this position, they make sure that the Protestants can't get outflanked the same way they did the last time. There's absolutely no way Tilly's going to be able to take the high ground from them without fighting his way all the way up from their left flank. The center of the Protestant line, to the left of this strong Star Palace defensive position, uh, this is fronted by six heavy artillery pieces, and it is supported by German musketeers. So you don't just have Bohemians there, you have volunteers from other Protestant states in the empire. Generally, these people are better equipped and have better morale. After all, none of them are conscripts. They're volunteers, and they're people with at least enough means to travel all the way here to help out. The left part of the Bohemian line is the weakest part. It's on flat ground, and it is defended entirely by conscripted Bohemians, mostly conscripted Bohemians, some volunteers, but the Bohemians are by far the least professional of all of these troops. Then again, Thurn himself is leading this part of the army on the left flank, and the area in front of them is protected by a stream with swampland along the banks. It's a little over a third of a mile away, but they can see if Imperial troops are starting to cross and, well, go in and wreak havoc on them while the Imperial army is marching through that sticky terrain. The Imperial army under Tilly arrives later in the day on November 2nd, and it makes camp a little over a mile away. Tilly's men have been marching all day, and there is no time to deploy them before dark, besides which, better if they get a good night's rest. The armies are about equal in size. There's about 25,000 imperial forces and Catholic League forces, give or take, under Tilly's command, and there's around 23,000 rebels. However, the imperials have... Uh, 18,000 infantry, give or take, compared to the rebels, 12,000. And while the rebels have nearly 11,000 cavalry, the Imperials only have around 7,000. That said, about half of those 11,000 uh, Protestant cavalry, they're not really what we would consider... Uh, heavy-hitting cavalry of the day. You know, you think of cuirassiers and, and uh, shock cavalry like that. These uh, arquebusier cavalry on the Bohemian side, they're light cavalry. Right? They carry primitive carbines, basically, and their job is to 
ride in and sort of support the heavier shock cavalry by getting right up to the enemy line and firing a volley at point-blank range and then running away to reload. And in this battle, fighting in a defensive formation, the arquebusier cavalry on the Protestant side, they form up in blocks between the blocks of infantry. Right, that way they can do a couple of things. They can fight defensively in place, even on foot if they have to, or they can hop on their horses and maneuver to assist other nearby units that need their help. They're pretty versatile. But again, Ethereum, the Imperials have a significant advantage in infantry, 18,000 to 12,000. Anyway, in more or less those positions, the Bohemian army goes to sleep. At dawn the next day, on November 8th, the lowlands in front of the rebel army are blanketed by a thick fog. This gives Tilly an opportunity. Remember that stream and the marshy land that was supposed to slow the Imperial forces down on their way up to the rebels? Well, Tilly quickly orders his army to cross the stream under the cover of fog. And by the time the morning fog lifts, the Imperial Catholic forces have made it across and are forming up about a third of a mile from the rebel army. Now, Matthias Stern recognizes the danger. He wants to attack them immediately before they can form up properly and while they're pinned up against this marshland and at a disadvantage. But his sub-commanders, including the Duke of Anhalt, who is commanding the center of the Protestant line, they overrule him. Right? They want to stick with the original plan of defending the high ground. On the imperial right, facing off against Thurn's vulnerable troops on the Protestant left, are imperial troops from the emperor's personal army. On the imperial left, facing the more entrenched rebels on the ridge and their German allies, are the Catholic League troops. And the Catholic League troops are under Tilly's direct command. He's leading from the center. The Catholics also have 12 cannons of their own twice as many as the rebels, and they nickname these the Twelve Apostles. And these are divided uh, with eight of them on the right side of the line with the Imperial troops, and the Catholic League troops on the left operate four of these cannons. And both sides engage in an artillery duel throughout the morning. While the Imperial forces have more guns, they're shooting at very long range for these old cannons, and they're shooting uphill. And most of their shots land harmlessly in the hillside. And the Protestants, shooting from higher ground, well, they score some hits. But there's only so much six old-timey cannons are going to do against 25,000 men standing a third of a mile away. The Imperial troops on the right attack first against the more vulnerable Bohemian troops under Thurn's command on the rebel left. Two regiments of Bohemian cavalry ride out and skirmish with them during the advance, trying to slow them down and disrupt their line of march and demoralize them a little bit. And when the Imperial troops get close... Thurn leads his men in a countercharge. Might as well, right? His men would not dig any trenches, so it's not like standing in place is going to do them much good. Might as well put the enemy on his back foot. And they perform surprisingly well. They actually force their way through the leading imperial blocks of cuirassier cavalry and turn those cavalry around. Those are some tough troops. But then they end up encountering these stout Imperial Infantry Regiments. 
These infantry fight in the Spanish Tercio style. This means they fight in blocks with a mix of pikemen and musketeers. Try and fight them from far out, and they'll shoot you. Try and get in close, and their long, pointy pikes are going to stick you before you can get in with your muskets, right? And your bayonets, or your swords, or even a regular spear. You're not going to be able to fight them man-to-man without pikes of your own. So the Bohemians stand back, and the two sides face off, exchanging volleys for a brief period, but it actually looks as if the rebels are about to break the imperial troops. And seeing this, from his position in the center of the imperial line, Tilly sends some of his cuirassiers over to help. Some of the Catholic League cuirassiers, these are heavy cavalry, and they charge into the Bohemian cavalry, including their valuable arquebusier cavalry, and uh, they chase them off. And without cavalry support, at least on this part of the line, Thurn's troops instead begin to break. The Imperials now have the upper hand and are chasing Thurn's troops uphill towards the rest of their army. But Tilly takes advantage. He has to. The Bohemians could stabilize this situation very quickly. Instead, he needs to follow up, and he does. And he leads the Catholic League troops in a daring uphill march against stout rebel defenses in the center right into the teeth of those six cannons and the German musketeers. And the Protestant defenses hold at first, but then some of the men see their own cavalry units retreating in the distance. Now, these are just the guys who uh, Tilly's cuirassiers have chased off, but in the confusion of battle and the fog of war, these guys see their own cavalry running off and they just assume that the Imperial cavalry has gotten around their flank and that the battle's lost. And they start running. And very quickly, the Bohemian rebel army goes from not too bad of a position to just completely broken and running away in disarray, and most of them get away. But a small contingent of German mercenaries on the right flank near the Star Palace, they end up getting surrounded and fighting to the last man. Now, later stories would exaggerate their feats, saying that they fought to the last man from... Protestant religious zeal, and that they refuse to retreat rather than give in to the empire. In reality, it seems like they were just cut off and surrounded, but they did die, and in fact, the Protestant army suffers around 4,000 casualties. That's a significant number, but it doesn't automatically doom them to defeat, at least in the overall war, right? They lost a battle. Reform, fight another day. But on the other hand, the Imperial forces have only suffered around 700 losses. Fairly easy day for them, all things considered. But more importantly, they've captured the rebel cannons and most of their supplies. Their supplies which are already in short supply. And the Bohemian troops are scattering in all directions. The Battle of White Mountain, as this battle is called, does not instantly annihilate the Protestant army. But the rebels have lost their cannons as well as their morale. The routing troops disperse, and most of them simply return to their homes, hoping to blend into the population rather than face the emperor's army again. In his book, A History of the Thirty Years' War, 18th century German historian and playwright Frederick Schiller tells us what becomes of the would-be Bohemian king Frederick, Matthias Thurn, and the Bohemian population in general. He writes, quote, Frederick was seated at table in Prague while his army was thus cut to pieces. 
it is probable that he had not expected the attack on this day, since he had ordered an entertainment for it. A messenger summoned him from table, to show him from the walls the whole frightful scene. He requested a cessation of hostilities for twenty-four hours for deliberation, but eight was all the Duke of Bavaria would allow him. Frederick availed himself of these to fly by night from the capital, with his wife and the chief officers of the army. This flight was so hurried that the Prince of Anhalt left behind him his most private papers, and Frederick his crown. I know now what I am, said this unfortunate prince to those who endeavored to comfort him. There are virtues which misfortune only can teach us, and it is in adversity alone that princes learn to know themselves. Prague was not irretrievably lost when Frederick's pusillanimity abandoned it. The light troops of Mansfeld were still in Pilsen, and were not engaged in the action. Bethlen Gabor might at any moment have assumed an offensive attitude and drawn off the emperor's army to the Hungarian frontier. The defeated Bohemians might rally. Sickness, famine, and the inclement weather might wear out the enemy. But all these hopes disappeared before the immediate alarm. Frederick dreaded the fickleness of the Bohemians, who might probably yield to the temptation to purchase, by the surrender of his person, the pardon of the emperor. Thurn and those of his party who were in the same condemnation with him found it equally inexpedient to await their destiny within the walls of Prague. They returned towards Moravia, with the view of seeking refuge in Transylvania. Frederick fled to Breslau, where, however, he only remained a short time. He removed from thence to the court of the Elector of Brandenburg, and finally took shelter in Holland. The Battle of Prague had decided the fate of Bohemia. Prague surrendered the next day to the victors. The other towns followed the example of the capital. The estates did homage without conditions, and the same was done by those of Silesia and Moravia. The emperor allowed three months to elapse before instituting any inquiry into the past. Reassured by this apparent clemency, many who at first had fled in terror appeared again in the capital. All at once, however, the storm burst forth. Forty-eight of the most active among the insurgents were arrested on the same day and hour, and tried by an extraordinary commission composed of native Bohemians and Austrians. Of these, twenty-seven, and of the common people an immense number, expired on the scaffold. The absenting offenders were summoned to appear at their trial, and failing to do so, condemned to death as traitors and offenders against his Catholic majesty. Their estates confiscated, and their names affixed to the gallows. The property also of the rebels who had fallen in the field was seized. This tyranny might have been borne as it affected individuals only, and while the ruin of one enriched another, but more intolerable was the oppression which extended to the whole kingdom without exception. All the Protestant preachers were banished from the country, the Bohemians first, and afterwards those of Germany. The letter of majesty Ferdinand tore with his own hand and burnt the seal. Seven years after the Battle of Prague, the toleration of the Protestant religion within the kingdom was entirely revoked. Unquote. And where those 27 rebel leaders were executed in 1621, 27 white crosses now mark the ground in Prague's Old Town Square. More importantly, Emperor Ferdinand is now the undisputed king of Bohemia. Frederick is in exile, and the Protestant Union has been disbanded. For the next two centuries, the people of Bohemia will live under strict Austrian rule. And it won't be until the Czech revival of the 19th century that there is any kind of serious nationalist movement in Bohemia again. And so it might have been throughout the entire Holy Roman Empire, but Ferdinand is now going to outreach his grasp, and through his own actions he will spread the fire of rebellion throughout all of Germany. See, he owes Duke Maximilian of Bavaria big time. Maximilian, who had been 
put forward as an alternative for the emperorship and refused to take it. Maximilian, who is head of the Catholic League, supplied most of the imperial forces to put down the Bohemian Rebellion, right? This guy, Maximilian, had done everything for Ferdinand, and in exchange, Ferdinand owed him. And so he had given Maximilian territory in Austria, but Austria is the emperor's land. It's splitting it up, especially splitting it up outside of the imperial family, could cause political friction down the road. Much better if Maximilian had land somewhere else. Well, fortunately, there is still a rebellious prince in the empire. Right? While Frederick is in exile, he has still not given up his claim to the throne of Bohemia. Meanwhile, his land in the Palatinate is ripe for the taking. With Ferdinand's blessing, Maximilian dispatches Tilly's army to the Palatinate in the western part of the Holy Roman Empire. In October of 1619, Ferdinand recognizes Maximilian as the rightful ruler of the Palatinate. This doesn't legally give him control, that would require a vote of the imperial diet, but it gives Maximilian and Tilly political cover for their seizure of the territory. And in 1620, Tilly is ready to invade, but he holds off since political negotiations are ongoing. Meanwhile, with the Protestant League defunct, there is nobody to organize a response to defend the Palatinate. Technically, von Mansfeld is still in the field as Frederick's chief general, and he holds several major forts in the Palatinate, but he has no funding, and his army needs to live off the land. In other words, they end up having to pillage the very people they're supposed to protect. In his book, The Thirty Years' War, 19th century British historian Samuel Rawson Gardner writes, quote, The appointment of Mansfeld was unfortunately in itself fatal to the chances of peace. Ever since the capture of Pilsen, his troops, destitute of support, had been the terror of the country where they were called to defend. In those days, indeed, the most disciplined army was often guilty of excesses from which in our days the most depraved outcasts would shrink. The soldiers, engaged merely for as long a time as they happened to be wanted, passed from side to side as the prospect of pay or booty allured them. No tie of nationality bound the mercenary to the standard under which accident had placed him. He had sold himself to his hirer for the time being, and he sought his recompense in the gratification of every evil passion of which human nature in its deepest degradation is capable. Yet, even in this terrible war, there was a difference between one army and another. And in an enemy's country, all plundered alike. Tilly's Bavarians had been guilty of horrible excesses in Bohemia. But a commander like Tilly, who could pay his soldiers and could inspire them with confidence in his generalship, had it in his power to preserve some sort of discipline. And if, as Tilly once told a complaining official, his men were not nuns, they were at all events able to refrain on occasion from outrageous villainy. A commander like Mansfeld, who could not pay his soldiers, must of necessity plunder wherever he was. His movements would not be governed by military or political reasons. As soon as his men had eaten up one part of the country, they must go to another, if they were not to die of starvation. They obeyed, like the elements, a law of their own, quite independent of the wishes or needs of the sovereign whose interests they were supposed to serve. Unquote. Now, in addition to his own meager forces, von Mansfeld does receive help from volunteers. These are individual soldiers and groups of men from the disbanded Protestant Union armies who flock to his cause. He also receives help from a few regiments of English troops, sent by Frederick's father-in-law, King James I, 
who is unwilling to help him become king of Bohemia, but fears losing influence if Frederick loses authority altogether, if he loses his land in the Palatinate. Now, these English troops are meant to keep the peace. James I has offered to become a mediator between Elector Frederick and Emperor Ferdinand, and it seems like both sides are considering a negotiated settlement. But the English troops are getting no money from von Mansfeld or anyone else in Frederick's administration. So their commander, Sir Horace Vere, authorizes a raid on the lands of the Catholic Bishop of Spires. This is what our historian Samuel Rawson Gardner was just talking about, right? It's a militarily and politically stupid thing to do. But the only alternative is uh, either starvation or, more likely, all of his men desert, so he authorizes the raid. And, predictably, the Catholics are outraged. And peace efforts quickly come to an end. And Spanish troops, once again assisting the emperor, they invade the Palatinate from the southwest, and Tilly's Catholic League troops invade from the east. Von Mansfeld's demoralized troops are once again unable to hold. With the population already rioting over the constant looting, they are soon driven from the Palatinate altogether. But Frederick and Von Mansfeld are not out of the fight. Von Mansfeld simply retreats a little further into Alsace, which is part of modern-day France, but which at the time is a personal holding of the emperor. Von Mansfeld takes the town of Hoganau, and he heavily fortifies it. And Frederick joins him there shortly thereafter in his new stronghold. So now, in the winter of 1621-1622, the Spanish and English are both involved in the war, and neither country really wants to be. King James of England only wants to secure the Palatinate for his daughter Elizabeth via her husband Frederick. England is wealthy, but lacks the manpower or the stomach for a major war on the European continent. But the Spanish, meanwhile, well, they only have a year left in their truce with the Dutch. Well, technically it's over, but the Resumption of conflict has not yet begun. They basically have a year left before there's going to be war again. They've secured the Spanish road, and they've really achieved all of the objectives that they want to achieve in the empire. And the Spanish empire, while it's very powerful, is actually surprisingly poor. There are reasons for that. They're outside the scope of this episode, but they're too poor to support simultaneous wars in Germany and the Netherlands. Right? When this war with the Dutch resumes, as it will any day now, they need to be out of Germany. They would really rather just somebody settle this issue with the Palatinate, as long as they have access through the western part of it. So, under pressure from both England and Spain to make peace... Uh, Frederick and Emperor Ferdinand agree to meet at Brussels and hash out their differences. There is actually never any grand summit with the two leaders, but proposals are passed back and forth. Frederick is even willing to give up the Palatinate and his title of elector, provided that when Maximilian of Bavaria dies right, because Maximilian was going to take that land and title. When Maximilian dies, the land and title will revert to Frederick's heir, not to Maximilian. Right, basically, he's saying, hey, punish me, don't punish my son, that's his inheritance. And Ferdinand is willing to accept this deal, but he insists that Frederick must then give up his son to be taught by Jesuits in Vienna. This basically amounts to a demand that Frederick's son convert to Catholicism. Right? It's not stated that way, but that's the intention, and that's something Frederick cannot accept. 
But meanwhile, while all of these peace talks are ongoing, other Protestant powers are beginning to act. The Margrave of Baden and the powerful Christian Duke of Brunswick come to the aid of the Protestant cause. But Christian needs time to raise his army, so the Margrave of Baden meets up with von Mansfeld and Frederick, and their combined forces defeat Tilly and force him back further into the Palatinate without Christian's help. But von Mansfeld and the Margrave cannot agree on an overall goal for the campaign. And so their armies split up and go off and do their own thing, and with the armies split... Tilly is able to successfully coordinate with his ally, the Spanish general Cordova, to catch the Margrave's army on its own and capture or destroy most of his men on May 6th, 1622. And then, while Duke Christian is finally coming down with his assembled army to meet Frederick, Tilly and Cordova catch him alone, and they catch his army at a river crossing, and while the Duke and some of his troops escape, he joins Frederick and von Mansfeld with a fraction of his previous force. And at this point, Frederick knows he is beaten. Both of his allies have been defeated in the field, one utterly, one only mostly, but he doesn't have anything serious left to fight with. So he takes his army back to Alsace, and then he releases Duke Christian and General von Mansfeld from his service. At that point, he goes into a voluntary exile at The Hague. He writes to his wife, Elizabeth, quote, Would to God that we possessed a little corner of the earth where we could rest together in peace. Unquote. In a sense, he gets his wish. He and his family live the rest of their lives in peace, mostly in The Hague. Although he will continue to play a minor role in diplomacy, Frederick's time on the world stage is at an end. Shortly thereafter, about six months thereafter, on February 13th, 1623, at a meeting of the Imperial Diet, possession of the Palatinate and the title of Elector Palatine are officially transferred to Maximilian of Bavaria. This rewards him amply for his service to Ferdinand, but... It also cements a 5-2 to two Catholic majority among the electors. And the decision on this issue, the decision to transfer these titles to Maximilian, well, that is what we would call today a party-line vote. It's passed with overwhelming Catholic support over strenuous objections from almost all of the Protestant princes in the empire. The remaining hostilities in the Palatinate will soon be over. The English, under Sir Horace Vere, surrender in March, under direct orders from King James. There's obviously no point in a peacekeeping mission anymore. In August, Tilly finally completes military operations with another major field victory over Christian of Brunswick this time forcing a complete and total Protestant surrender. For now, the emperor promises that he will continue to abide by his previous promise that no Protestant lands will be forcibly converted as long as they remain loyal to the emperor. But Ferdinand needs to pay his officers, particularly a general named Albrecht von Wallenstein, who had come to prominence as one of Tilly's sub-commanders and eventually as a commander in his own right. Right, Ferdinand decides that this payment can come from North Germany in the Protestant lands. 
There are a number of small bishoprics there in that area that have fallen into Protestant hands over the years, and Ferdinand seizes them back, or more accurately, authorizes von Wallenstein to seize them back. Once again, Ferdinand is continuing to agitate his people because he has to pay somebody for the last rebellion, right? He puts down the Bohemian Rebellion, but to pay for it, he has to go and fight some more in the Palatinate to get uh, Maximilian of Bavaria his payment, his land, right? Well, now he's got somebody else to pay. He's got to pay von Wallenstein, and he does the same thing. He goes to pay him out of the pockets of the Protestants, or more accurately, out of their land. And the amount of land involved is not consequential, nor is the amount of money. Right? These are very, very small territories. Sometimes we're talking about, like, the cathedral of a city and the grounds of the cathedral. Right? The amount of money is not that consequential. Very little is coming from the people themselves. Again, most of these bishoprics, the value is in the building itself, and you know maybe there are some relics there, and there's some revenue from pilgrims and stuff, but the average everyday people are not suffering from this. But these bishoprics, these small bits of land, sometimes less than an acre, sometimes dozens of acres, but still not all that large considering the size of northern Germany. But these are little tiny patches scattered all throughout Protestant land. So you have a few Catholic troops here, you have a few Catholic troops there, and a few more over there, and a few more up in this area, and all of a sudden, the local people throughout northern Germany, which is overwhelmingly Protestant at this time, they start to feel threatened. They feel like there are imperial troops and Catholic League troops everywhere. In the event of a new outbreak of hostilities, if the emperor were to decide he wanted to crack down on the Protestants, well, in that case, there will already be imperial forces dotted all over the land. And then, in the meantime, the local Protestant princes are still unable to raise money and fund a regular army. As a matter of fact, rather than fall into von Mansfeld's error of pillaging their own people, they've actually disbanded their armies. There are virtually no Protestant troops anywhere in the empire at this time. They have all gone home. Right? The only active duty troops, the only ones patrolling anywhere or holding any territory by and large, are the Imperial and Catholic League troops. Even so, in earlier times, the empire's political mechanisms would have prevented further conflict. Right? The Protestants would have had political redress for these issues, but at this point, the Protestants have no effective political voice. They are outnumbered five to two among electors. There is no Protestant union anymore. And with the Protestants so weakened, Ferdinand has no need to negotiate with them. He has no need to use politics. So he keeps getting greedier and greedier. And as Samuel Rawson Gardner eloquently states, quote, It was the old story. With the empire, the diet, and the church in the hands of mere partisans, there was nothing to remind men of their duty as citizens of a great nation. Even the idea of being members of a circle was too high to be seriously entertained. The cities strove to thrust the burden of defense upon the princes, and the princes thrust it back upon the cities. The flood was rapidly rising, which was to swallow them all. Unquote. 
And the flood that Gardner is talking about is Denmark. Earlier in the episode, I teased the fact that King Christian of Denmark, Norway, had some lands in the empire. And King Christian of Denmark, Norway, is a Protestant. So, any further changes Ferdinand makes inside the empire, well, they will impact this powerful Danish king directly. And when Ferdinand overreaches again and provokes an open war with Denmark, the escalation of the conflict will spread the war outside the empire's borders and into the Baltic. Later on, Sweden will get involved, and after that, France. And the war will not end until millions are dead. The Thirty Years' War would end with the Treaty of Westphalia, the founding blueprint for modern nationalism. But none of it would have happened if not for a national revolt in Bohemia. And that's why it's relevant. Guess who? It's me again, Dan, and I'm here just to tell you about a few things we're doing to expand the channel here at Relevant History. The first thing that we're doing is a series called Dan's War College. This is a series of exclusive videos from yours truly detailing various military battles and tactics in history and breaking down how they worked in a little more detail than we do here on the main show. If you're interested in that, it is a Patreon exclusive. The link for the Relevant History Patreon is in the description, and the monthly fee for the subscription is $5. By the way, with that, you also get access to a private Discord chat room with yours truly. And yes, I take requests. For those Patreon videos. Of course, not everybody is able to or wants to contribute financially, and that's just fine. I'm glad you're listening. But if you enjoy the show, why not share it with a friend? Help grow the audience and share something you love with somebody who might enjoy it. Also, it never hurts to leave a review. People are more likely to listen if they see a show with a bunch of reviews, particularly good ones, but eh, if you hated the show, go ahead and leave a review saying that, too. Tell me why you didn't like it. Alternatively, you could just reach out to me on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. You can also reach me at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com if you think that I've made an error in one of the episodes or you just wanted to say hello. Finally, to find all of my episodes with links to all the various subscription services and podcast feeds as well as my blog, which I have not updated in ages, but eh, you never know. You can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.